morning to all of you this morning and to our uh, lines of communication over hi fi and whatever it is. <laughs> this morning we're talking about in Jack, Acts chapter 8, the church as it went through the persecutions. I thought it was interesting that we sang some of the songs of praise that we did this morning, and I'm sure Stephen was thinking of those things as he was being stoned. Showers of blessing. Uh, no, those are rocks. <laughs> but you know, his, his mind was in a different place than the people that were stoning him. He was seeing a vision of Jesus at the right hand of the Father, which was so powerful, I think, that it overcame realizing the situation he was in. And that's what aggravated the people, I think, even more, those that were throwing the stones at him. But remember, the same mighty power is at work within you as a believer, as was in Stephen and his, was in Christ and was in God as he raised Christ from the dead. So, the church persecuted and scattered. How does the word spread? Well, what Satan often uses for evil, we know that God uses for good. He has a way of turning things around. So after church this morning, when I'm through persecuting you, I want you to be scattered out to your homes and your neighbors talking about Jesus. So, that sound good? Well, I'm really not going to persecute you. But, uh, a short review before we begin chapter 8 of Acts. Stephen was stoned for preaching the good news about Jesus to those who, well, many of them wanted to hear it and were saved, but others that were some of the religious leaders didn't want to hear his message, and they were very angry at him. The two things they didn't want to hear were, you don't need the temple to offer sacrifices and worship God in anymore. Well, that was just like saying something that was totally uh, opposite of what they had always believed. And he says, the law given to you on the mount by Mo to Moses is now being superseded by the Holy Spirit that God is putting in your hearts. Doesn't mean the Ten Commandments aren't good. Doesn't mean the Ten Commandments aren't right. But what, he's, what God was trying to tell them was, you can't really keep the Ten Commandments. You're not able to do that. And I'm going to take, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone tablets that you've been trying to keep. I'm going to make it possible for you to do this. So in Acts 7, 45, 54 through 60, the end of last week's message, they were furious, they gnashed their teeth. But all this time, Stephen, Stephen was experiencing something different, come thou fount of every blessing. Uh, he was having blessings seeing Jesus at the right hand of the Father when everybody else was stoning him to death. He was not taken up with his troubles, but he was having a vision of something else altogether. And my prayer for us is that we will see things uh, as God sees them. And see, Stephen was seeing them even in this time of great persecution. Then we'll see the blessings all around us when things aren't going our way. Anybody ever have a day when things aren't going your way and it looks really depressing? I mean, we all have those days. We need to be realizing that God is still in control and God is still leading us through these things, and if we'll watch, we'll see oftentimes where we can be a great blessing, even in the midst of what we think everything is going anywhere. Now, the Jewish leaders were yelling at Stephen, they were rushing him, they drug him out of town, they stoned him to death with rocks, laying their coats at someone else's feet by the name of Saul, who we'll talk about later, and they call him Paul a little later. And what was Stephen doing? He was praying. For himself, oh Lord, keep these wretches off of me? No. He was praying rather for those who were persecuting him. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. This was his dying prayer. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. It reminds me of Jesus' dying prayer as well. And he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So a question for us today is, what do you do when you're mistreated, not appreciated, people are doing things to you they shouldn't be, what is your prayer for them? Smack them, Lord. No. <laughs> well, David prayed that way a couple times, didn't he? Slay my enemies, Lord. So I guess that's a human way to do it. But, but Stephen and Jesus were praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
Persecution was beginning to come against the early church. And you know, it may come against us one of these days too. It's coming in the world today. There are many Christians today that are being martyred for the faith. It just is not right here in America yet. But if you look at the news and watch what's happening, you'll see more and more frustration coming. So I think we need to be prepared. It was so bad there in Jerusalem that people were leaving their homes and they were going to Samaria and Judea. They were just leaving their, their homes behind and leaving. And on that day, and on a day, a great, the scripture says, on, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Samaria. Saul began destroying the church going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Gender equality. He was persecuting everybody. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You want to stop something, just scatter people and run them off. No, it didn't seem to work, did it? They scattered the people, but they went preaching the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaritan. Samaria and proclaim the Messiah there. So what word did they preach? Is a good question. I think they preached Jesus. John wrote in his gospel, the word became flesh. The word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And they were preaching the word. They were preaching Jesus. They were talking about Jesus. And this is just what Jesus had told them when we read Acts chapter 1, verse 8, on the day of Pentecost. Before he ascended back to be with his Father, he said to them, After the Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. That's where they were. But they were being scattered now out to Samaria and Judea. And that's where they are going and preaching the word. Certainly when the Jewish leaders and Saul began persecuting the new believers, their intention was not to spread the word. It was not for good, it was for evil. However, as I say, we've seen before, God will take what the devil intends for evil and use it for good. Remember when Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, was sold into slavery, and uh, later he was put in prison. All the evil things that happened to him, the bad things that happened, yet he came out and he became second in command in Egypt. The Pharaoh put him in second in command, put him in charge of all the grain leaves. He was the one, or God through him, used him to spare the lives of so many people that were suffering during the time of the great famine. Seven years of famine. God used Joseph. So, are you ever mistreated? Ever been mistreated? Ever felt like people didn't really appreciate you? Misjudged you? If so, and that you will have. Hang on. Because God will use it for good. Now, you might not use it the next day for good. Or the same day. You may have to hang on for a little while. You may need patience. You may need faith. But those are things that he offers us. Maybe someday they'll write a book about you, like they have in the Bible. Well, probably not. You're probably not going to get your book. But you know, God says that he takes note of even a glass of water that you give to someone. This is a good time of year to do it, too, when it's this hot. Thank you for your water this morning. God yes. took notice of you having us all. Cold water this morning. So perhaps it would be a good thing if when things aren't going our way the way we think they should, that we stop and pray and consider that maybe God still has a plan and want this, wants to use us in some way even through this time of trial or frustration or persecution in our life. Verse 5 says, Now we see Peter going down from Jerusalem to Samaria to proclaim Christ there. Now, who were the people in Samaria? Samaria were they believers? Uh, he's going down there. Well, we know Jesus had gone there once before. Remember when he went to a well to get some water? He sent the believers into town to get some food. 
And a woman came out from town in the middle of the hot day to get water, which was quite unusual. They usually did it in the morning when it was cool. But she didn't want to travel with some of the other ladies because they were giving her a bad time. Uh, they thought she was not too good a woman. Uh, and, and the Jews, anyway, were hated by the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. They got into scuffles all the time. Remember way back in Solomon's day, when the kingdom was split, and you still had your charts, I know, in your Bible, and you're keeping track of all that. The northern and the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom fell to Assyria in 2 Kings 14 through 20 in 721 B.C. It lasted about 200 years, 210 years. Years later, the, the southern kingdom fell to the Babylonians in 587 B.C. And the northern kingdom, when defeated, mixed in and intermarried with the Samaritan people. So they intermarried and they lost their true uh, racehood. I guess that's not the way to say it, but their purity of their, their race. Purity of their race. And uh, they were never left to be unreminded of that by the others who stayed true to their Jewish nature. They didn't intermarry and they remained pure Jews. So there was this big argument going anyway between the two. Later they looked down on the Samaritans because they were not true Jewish people. There was even trouble when they passed through the lands where they lived. They got into fights, they got into all kinds of arguments. However, not always. Jesus went through Samaria that one time. He met that woman at the well. And uh, after she met him, something a little different happened. It changed her life. She found forgiveness for all of her past sins and problems. And she went to town, and being a good disciple, she just spread it around. She told everybody about Jesus and what he had done. Here's a man that, that knew everything about me, she says. And she says, uh, could it be? That he's the Messiah. So people, and, and then many of the people did receive him as Messiah, not because of her words, but what they saw him do following that time. So now Philip is entering Samaria. Jesus has given his life on the cross, the Holy Spirit has come, and Philip is preaching the word. And as he goes into Samaria, they begin to see miraculous signs begin to happen. Well, as we just read this morning, the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is in us today too. The same power of God is within his believers today. So don't be surprised. Be ready. You might be surprised sometime what God expects you to do. Be willing to move in obedience to it. Evil spirits came out of people. Paralytics and cripples were healed. And the Bible says so there was great joy in that city. They were having a good time. They were happy. And now we, we're seeing happen what Jesus said would happen after the Holy Spirit would come on his believers, on his followers. Spiritual gifts are given. Various ministries of the Holy Spirit are beginning to happen. Among Philip's followers, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8, verse 9 through 25, there's a fellow named Simon who is a sorcerer. It says, now for some time, verse 9, chapter 8, this. For now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention. And they exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and the miracles that he saw. Now, to define sorcerer, we would use words like occult, magical practices, demonic spirits, drugs, all of these things were probably involved. And Simon was called the great power. There were things happening around him that people were astounded by. And this is not something totally new. If you remember, uh, back in Moses' day, Moses, when talking to the Pharaoh one time, threw down his staff and he turned into a serpent. 
And everybody was amazed. And Pharaoh called his magicians. They all threw down their walking canes and they turned them into servants. That was pretty, pretty powerful. The only problem was Moses' servant ate up the other servants. <laughs> and all the other false prophets had to walk home without a walking stick. <laughs> the difference. Now we see the power of God surpassing the occult again or the magical powers that the enemy seems to have. Simon himself knows the difference. He's seen his power and now he sees the power of God. And so he believes, it says, and was baptized and followed Philip, astonished by the great signs and the miracles that Philip was doing. Well, I'm not too sure what kind of a baptism Simon the Sorcerer had. Uh, if you were a Calvinist, you would probably say he was not really saved when he was baptized. If you were an Arminian, you would probably say he fell, he, he fell away from the Lord after he was baptized. That was pretty quick fall, too. Um, and I don't even want to get into all of that. Certainly, he was water baptized, that was sure. Spirit baptized is questionable, I guess. Uh, one more word about baptism, and I'm going to try to get off that subject. I don't like talking about baptism all the time. I like talking about Holy Spirit baptism and Jesus' baptism. I don't like getting into arguments about what kind of baptisms you need. But you know, we need to understand what water baptism meant to the common Jewish person. Uh, or someone that was converting to Judaism. That's where it all started. Water was used as a symbol of cleansing and purifying for many years before John the Baptist ever came on the scene. And uh, they were to be baptized when they became a Jewish believer uh, in the water, living water, water that was moving, not still. It was called the Tibla. And it was fresh moving water through a, a river or a stream or even something they built where they would divert the water into and then back out of. This was also, there were many baptisms that were required. A woman was required to be baptized after having her period. A man after a seminal discharge. After a family, a man and a woman had sexual intercourse. After touching a dead corpse. There were many, many reasons for having water baptisms. And even after Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness, as John put it, they still continued a lot of these rituals. However, John said, as he baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, now there comes one after me that will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And Paul later tells the Ephesians, truly there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So Simon has a water baptism, and now he's trying to buy the Holy Spirit. And here I'm going to deviate from the Bible for a second, like the Apostle Paul did on occasion, and tell you what I think about it, my experience with baptism. I was water baptized when I was nine years old. And if you were to ask my mother who's in heaven now, she would tell you that it didn't do a bit of good. <laughs> Uh, then I asked Jesus into my life 15 years later and I received a Holy Spirit baptism that nobody else knew about it wasn't a service it was when the Holy Spirit came into my life when I confessed my sins and asked him to come into my life and that changed my life a year later, when I began to read the Bible for a year, I found out there was more about the Holy Spirit than I understood. And I understood that he even had something in there called the filling of the Holy Spirit, that we needed to be filled, not just baptized, but filled with the Holy Spirit, and constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. He being filled with the Spirit is the way to put it. So when I was uh, 24 years old, I began being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I have been being filled with the Holy Spirit since I was 24, now I'm 82. And I'm still being filled with the Holy Spirit. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit each day. And I wake up in the mornings asking God to fill me and 
keep me filled with His Holy Spirit. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the Word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw the Spirit was given on the laying on, at the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, Give me this also, this ability, so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter answered him, he said, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord, in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Any of you ever talked to an angel? Ever had one talk? Oh, come on. Don't pull out. My wife is an angel, so she knows you're just getting on her. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road. It goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So they started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Canbate, or Canbate, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, I'm going to mark that down, the Spirit told Philip, the Spirit still speaks to believers today. Now you may not hear an audible voice, but you'll know when the Spirit speaks to you, I guarantee you. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near. That's all he told him. He didn't tell him anything else. You ever get just little blurts of information from the Lord to do something and he doesn't tell you the whole story? <laughs> and then after you go and you're obedient to him, then he tells you the next line and the next line. Sometimes if he tell you the whole story, you'd probably be afraid to go. So he gives it to you if you're able to handle it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Philip probably was saying, oh, that's why the Holy Spirit sent me. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with this very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. The good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
And as I said, I don't think an angel ever spoke to me. I had some very wonderful older saints that have given me advice over the years, but I don't think they were angels because they died and gone to heaven now. But Philip does what the angel says, and he sees the Ethiopian man, Ethiopian man riding along in his chariot, reading from the scriptures. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship. And Philip asked this man under the leadership of the Holy Spirit if he understood what he was reading. Now here's what I want you to notice about this passage. Philip is not pushing his way into this man's life. He's just obeying what the Spirit says. Go and join yourself to this man riding along a chariot. Or just go close to it and stay by it. He's simply following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we get so nervous, we think, well, I can't go tell people about Jesus. Well, you don't have to go tell people about Jesus. You just have to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. If the Holy Spirit says, go and stand on the corner of that street, then go and stand on the corner of that street. If somebody comes by and they're looking confused, just say, can I help you? That's all Philip is doing here. He's not planning to preach a sermon when he starts out. He's just obeying the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit knows where you should go, and the Holy Spirit knows what you should say, and the Holy Spirit knows what you should do. So we just need to let the Holy Spirit guide our life and be ready to do whatever he tells us. He's simply making himself available to the Holy Spirit and using him to be a blessing. And that's what we have to do. We're not smart enough to do a whole of the other stuff. We just need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and make ourselves available. Yeah, I know. I'm right in the middle of this. I didn't plan to be pastoring for a while. Remember, I told you that. And I don't know that you did either one. Of we just said yes to the Holy Spirit when he told us to do something wasn't all in our plans, and we don't know the outcome of all of our actions. The Ethiopian eunuch went back to Africa and became a witness for Jesus, just like the Samaritan woman went to Samaria and told everybody about the Lord. So how do we apply this to our lives today? When persecution comes to you, to me. We can hang on in faith and belief that Jesus knows that we are being persecuted, frustrated, given a bad time. And we can know that what the enemy intends for evil, God will use for good. Enemies can become friends when Jesus comes into their life. We see that with the Samaritans and the Jews as they both come to know Jesus. We need to make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit like Philip. We need to realize that just because somebody does something phenomenal or seemingly miraculous, it might not necessarily be something God is doing in the days ahead of us. We need to know God's power is greater than the powers of demonic spirits and evil forces. Jesus in Matthew 24 and 24 said, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect. I suppose when people were, or when the Egyptian magicians were throwing their staffs on the ground and they all were turning into snakes, it probably seemed pretty miraculous. Jesus said there will come a time when these things kind of miraculous things will be happening again. Even if it were possible, the, the believers would be deceived. So just because you see something, make sure it comes from the Lord, not from some other mysterious, magical thing in the days and age that we live. But realize,
realize that our God is greater than these things. And remember that you, as the believer of God, when you ask the Holy Spirit in your life to fill you with his presence and his power, he gives you the same power and ability that was enough that he used to raise Christ. Chew on that while. That's gum. You don't swallow. Just keep chewing on it and thinking about it today. He has put within you the power of his Holy Spirit. The same power is available to raise Jesus from the dead. There's nothing you're going to face in this life that's too great for you to overcome. There's nothing, no place he's going to put you in this life where you can't come out victorious. If you listen and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're beginning to see in the book of Acts. Remember your chart. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, the ministries of the Holy Spirit, that chart. It shows you all of these things. God will put into your life as you need it to do His work and His work. So Father, uh, dismiss us with your blessing. And your benediction, may we be sure that we are filled with your Holy Spirit at all times and able to meet the needs that we will find around us. May we not be like uh, Simon the sorcerer who is trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit, for it's something we know we can't buy. We just submit to you and ask you to fill us and use us. And this is what we do. And we pray that in Jesus' name.